Welcome back to Small Business Big Lessons, a Buffer original series. My name is Ash Reed, Head of Content at Buffer, and throughout this series, we're going on a journey to understand how great work happens. We're telling stories of unique businesses and meeting the incredible people behind them, examining how they're doing things differently and what we can learn from their journeys. Trident Booksellers and Cafe is a mainstay in Boulder, Colorado. It's one constant in an ever-evolving city. It first opened its doors in 1980. Its founders were a part of Boulder's Buddhist community, and from day one, the Trident has celebrated independent thinking, a perfect fit for Boulder's liberal and hippie culture. But even as the city has changed around it, with an influx of tech businesses and startups over the past decade, the Trident has remained the same unique and quirky place it's always been. But then came the pandemic, a moment of reckoning for small businesses across the globe. And for the Trident, it led to nine longtime employees signing their name on the dotted line as the cafe and bookstore became employee owned for the first time in its history. In this episode, we'll be learning about employee ownership, worker co-ops, and how these models are changing workplace democracy and culture. My name is Cyan. I have worked at the Trident for six years. I am an employee owner, and I also run the bookstore part of the business. My name's Jake. Uh, I'm the assistant manager at the Trident. I've worked here for five years. I've been assistant manager for about three and a half or four years. My name is Peter Jones. I'm the general manager of Trident Booksellers and Cafe. We spoke to these employee owners in the Trident's back office during a busy day in the cafe, and they painted a vivid picture of Boulder, a place that's affectionately known as the city nestled between the mountains and reality. Boulder is a really, really beautiful place. It almost is out of a fairy tale or a snow globe or something. There's like this really beautiful mountainous scene, dusted with snow sometimes. The people are beautiful, the outdoors are beautiful. So when you drive into Boulder, there's this kind of like bubble that you hit, this like sort of energy bubble. Um, you can you can just tell like there's something like kind of circulating and like nestling. Yeah, I was born and raised in Boulder. I've tried to live in a few other places, but I always seem to come back to Boulder. So something's going on here that draws me back. The town itself and the people that seem to live here have certain quirky uniquenesses that keep Boulder sort of exciting and lively and more interesting than your average town, especially one of this size. The Trident Booksellers and Cafe is a unique historic building in the middle of Boulder's Pearl Street Mall, the city's hub for dining, arts and shopping. Pearl Street is home to over 1,000 businesses, but few, if any, have as many stories to tell as the Trident. First time I came to the Trident, I thought it was like the weirdest place I'd ever been. Um, <laughs> I had some friends who were like, you gotta come to Trident, you gotta come to Trident. I'm like, ah, oh, that place is so weird though. But you know, yeah, once I got over it, like uh, I started like actually like drinking the teas and the coffees and like sitting and like making friends and stuff. It was, you can tell there's like something going on here. The Trident has a steady stream of beloved regulars, a rolling cast of interesting characters that have almost become a part of the furniture. Some have even been getting their daily coffee at the Trident for nearly 30 years. This has led to a real community feel and a true bond between employees, customers, and the place itself. The people that pass through the Trident are really unique. We love our community here. We have a lot of different personalities, a lot of characters. Everyone is so unique and we love them all. We have some really interesting regulars to come in. You know, we have people who have been coming here for 30 or 35 years or even since we opened. And then we also have a lot of artists, a lot of a huge creative community here. I know that there's been short stories written about the Trident, songs written about the Trident. I've been to a lot of places in my time and, you know, a lot of cafes and bookstores, and I've never found one that um, is unique like this. We're now going into our 41st year, so that gives us a lot of historical uh, legacy that we still carry forward. You definitely feel a lot of that just when you come into the establishment. We're not totally profit-driven. We're not just trying to make it to the next quarter and grow and grow and grow. It feels like people's voices are respected. They feel heard. The Trident's so unique. It feels like such a special thing to be a part of. It's really like no other place I've ever been. I feel incredibly lucky to own a part of it. 
The Trident is a business people have always loved working for, with many employees staying for years and even returning after time away from Boulder. It's a special place that's hard to leave, but six months into the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the Trident's longtime owners decided it was time to step aside. And instead of selling to another existing owner or looking for outside investment, the Trident's owners took a leap and bet its future on becoming employee owned. One of the owners that owned the Trident decided to sell their share. And so the employees decided to buy that share. So we own, collectively, we own a third of the business. As employees, you know, we're here every day. We're interacting with people every day. And so it felt kind of maybe like a power disparity when someone would come in and they might ask to speak to the owner. And it felt kind of strange because we were the people there every day and we knew what was going on. And we know the ins and outs and like the daily business and how everything runs. On September 15th, 2020, nine of Trident's employees became owners and the business's top-down hierarchy became a level playing field. The idea was that ownership would give employees a feeling of security in unpredictable times, as well as a unique opportunity to own a business in downtown Boulder. Trident's ownership group went from four to 13, with everyone's voice and voting rights treated as equal. And just as the new employee owners now join key business meetings and run payroll, the longtime owners also pull shifts in the bookstore and coffee shop. Anyone can buy in and become an owner too, they just need to have worked at the Trident for at least a year. For many of the Trident's long-serving employees, it felt like a natural progression to become a co-owner of the business. And it helped to address the balance between the staff running the business day to day and the other business owners. And so it did feel a little bit like the power dynamic was a little bit shifted in a way that wasn't maybe reflective of how the day-to-day -day business was. Yeah, I do believe that most small businesses do have a tension um, between the owners and the employees, almost any business, not just small business. Um, generally, you're you're working, quote unquote, for the man, you know, whether you have any direct communication with ownership or not is a huge what if as an employee, whether you have any sort of say or rights in terms of labor or, or breaks. I think a lot of businesses are somewhat absentee owned in the sense that the owners are generally not working uh, shifts. They're generally not hanging out all the time. The staff is the ones that are there all the time. They're the ones that know how the business is running, how smooth it is, how the customers are reacting, uh, how people feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And so their input and involvement in the business is critical, I feel, but often overlooked or maybe not taken fully when there is some sort of discussion between ownership and staff. So one of the goals of making it employee-owned was to try and relieve that tension somewhat. The Trident is one of a growing number of partly or fully employee-owned businesses, but there are many forms of employee ownership. From businesses like the Trident, where employees own a certain percentage of the business, to cooperatives or co-ops, where each worker has an equal share. To learn more about the co-op model and to better understand how employee ownership can benefit workers and the wider community, we spoke to Esteban Kelly. My name is Esteban Kelly, and I'm the executive director for the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. We're the only national grassroots membership-based organization for worker-owned cooperative businesses in the U.S. And I'm also a co-founder and a worker owner in my own worker co-op called Aorta, which is a small co-op business. There's about 12 of us in it. And we, um, Aorta is an acronym. It stands for Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance. Uh, we exist to catalyze movements for social, racial, and economic justice by offering facilitation, consulting, conflict resolution, kind of modeling those skills, um, and, and helping to guide groups through vision and strategic planning work. I usually start by explaining the cooperative business model by reminding people that it is a business model. There's a lot of confusion, I think especially in Anglophone countries, around charities and nonprofits and because there's this mission and purpose. I mean, really until some of the B Corp stuff and the socially responsible business movement sector emerged, there really wasn't a sense that a cooperative uh, or that a business model should be centered around a mission. It's a way for people who are putting their labor into the business to have ultimate accountability and say and input about what they're doing, how they're doing it, what their priorities are, and how to navigate many of the complex decisions that come through any kind of business. 
Worker cooperatives exist in every industry. They're not actually limited in any fundamental way. And there also is not a one-size-fits-all management structure or decision-making structure. Worker co-ops and employee-owned businesses offer more people the chance to be heard and help make key business decisions. There's sometimes a sense that cooperatives are, by their very nature, inherently flat collectives. And while that might be true for some cooperatives, there, there's certainly many, many in my country that have a flat structure. And usually that's, that exists when they're small. If they're you know, under 30 people, it becomes really hard to run something as a flat collective otherwise. But generally, it's pretty flexible. I think the thing that matters is that there is a sense of um, general assembly where all the members, all the, the co-owners of a worker cooperative business operate on a one member, one vote basis, that they share equal ownership, um, equal shares, equal contribution. So we have 13 owners. Um, nine of which are employee owners. We have meetings bi-weekly, and during those meetings we have an agenda. We have a shared document that everyone contributes their agenda items, and then we just go through the list. What we really value is what I call consensus building. Um, so to us, that means that everyone is heard. Everyone's opinion is respected. Everyone gets a say. And then at the end of those discussions, we do, if we need to make like a decision, a yes or no decision, we take a vote and it's a majority vote. And so even if everyone doesn't agree or everyone doesn't get the outcome that they wanted, we all really respect each other's opinions and our thoughts. The cooperative and employee-owned model is on the rise. And this is in no small part due to Esteban and his organization. As the world of work is changing and people begin to question power structures both in and outside of work, the cooperative model can increase democracy in the workplace and bestow more responsibility and ownership upon people of all backgrounds and experiences. It's been a very intentional vision and plan from people like myself to take cooperatives from being an alternative or being seen as, as, as an alternative to being something that is mainstream, that we don't see any way to address all of the problems in our society without expanding democracy. Workplace democracy is a huge piece of that. And part of that means that it's inadequate to just sort of drop out or opt out. Um, I think that that was some of the experiments that happened from what we call the baby boomer generation in the 1960s and 70s. There was a sense of, well, you know, society's messed up. Let's just drop out and do our own thing over here. And whereas cooperatives used to be a way to opt out of the mainstream economy, they're now a way for people to opt into the mainstream economy. That so many people, whether it's because they're um, they're young workers, LGBTQIA, um, immigrants, undocumented workers, people of color, uh, freelance and, and contingent workers, uh, people who work in sectors that usually aren't remunerated fairly, cooperatives become one of the best ways to actually gain gainful employment or to stabilize your, your circumstances or to employ yourself when you didn't have access to employment in a traditional kind of capitalist firm. Employee ownership can come with enormous and life-changing benefits for those who have the opportunity to become business owners. I was an employee for five years and then over the past year I became an owner and it's just given me more, I mean obviously ownership, but like even more pride than I already had in our community. It's one thing to like be running the day to day and be interacting with customers and it's a whole other thing to be able to run payroll and to do daily deposits and process QuickBook entries. And it makes me feel more empowered that I know everything that's going on. And I know not only the day to day runnings, but like the back half of it too. But I would say as one of the owners, I do feel like an extra level of pride when someone compliments what we're doing. Becoming an owner of a Trident was a very important thing for me. I hung out here before I worked here and then also working here over the years. I've invested a lot of my own time and you know life to this place. And so becoming an owner sort of makes it a full circle and, and brings it around to justify not only all my past decisions of still working here, hanging out here, why am I here? Um, to now carrying forward into the future that ah, I am an owner, I am part of this business and the community that it's, revolves around it. Income only gets you so far, especially in a country like the United States. And so ownership and increasingly in the 21st century economy where the opportunities to get access 
the assets are diminishing, right? Home ownership is plummeting uh, among younger generations. Uh, everyone's encumbered with debt. So what does it look like to actually own something? Something that you can liquidate or sell off or leverage against in order to borrow. Nowadays, worker ownership and employee ownership and cooperative ownership are, are one of the few vehicles that's actually ascendant, that is, that's growing and rather than going in the other direction. For many of Trident's new employee owners, they never could have fathomed owning a business in downtown Boulder, especially in a historic and prime location like Pearl Street. All the younger owners that bought in are in their 20s and 30s. And so for the people of that age and that generation to be able to say they own a legacy business in downtown Boulder is something that is simply not possible anywhere else. They would never think of that in their wildest dreams. And so to be able to say that, you know, resonates very deeply with every single owner. And so their ability to make decisions on the fly, to say yes, no to uh, customers or to take on a, a rude customer without feeling like punishment's going to happen or any sort of, you know, top down management's going to happen to have a hand directly in the products we carry. Everything is now a group decision. And so that empowerment sort of seeps in and resonates throughout everything. Yeah, I mean, it feels great to know that I have investment in like historic business. It's cool. It, it feels good to know that I'm probably going to like be involved in this for a while. Uh, it makes me both more invested in it, but also like plan for the long term and start building, like laying the foundation for the long term. The staff that our owners have sort of changed. It's very subtle. You, you wouldn't necessarily notice it if you just walked in, but uh, the level of pride that they take, the level of concern they have, how involved they are and you know, the direction of the business, how the, the energy of the business, the vibe, all that is sort of picked up in subtle ways. I think offering ownership to the staff was a boon for the business itself. I see employee ownership as improving workplace democracy because ownership is the essential basis through which we can have determination around all of the material goods in our lives. You know, most people are, are laboring, let's just say four to six, sometimes seven days a week. And so the idea of actually having a democratic component to your everyday life, the ability to actually have your voice matter, to not just participate, to not just have like a, uh, a voice, but to really have a say, have a say in shaping um, the conditions of your work. That's part of the horizon that we're moving toward is transforming the conditions of labor. There is popular support for employee ownership and co-op models in the United States, and it enjoys uniquely bipartisan political support too. But that doesn't mean there aren't obstacles in the way for any business looking to adopt a shared or co-op ownership structure. It's interesting when we do advocacy and education for elected officials, people embedded in city government, there is, even in this hyper-partisan, whatever, climate, there is almost no resistance. I mean, no one is against co-ops, including worker co-ops. There's something about worker co-ops where you see all of the things that align with what your values are. And it kind of doesn't matter what your values are. If you like small businesses, if you believe that rural communities need uh, viable economic livelihoods, right? It cuts across race, class, whatever, gender, documentation status. This is just a model that works for whoever in whatever industry. It also doesn't matter what industry you're in. When people come in and they know that we're employee owned, they're so excited about it. We have bookmarks that say that we're employee owned, so sometimes people come in on that. People say that that's really great, super exciting, and that they would love to see more businesses doing stuff like that. So then where does the resistance come from? The resistance is everything else. Our entire economy is set up to disincentivize. There's a million and one regulatory hurdles, right? So when you're trying to create new laws or do something that's good and nice with, with whoever is currently in office, they're like, ooh, this is, I'm all ears. These are all, you know, all the statistics, everything I'm reading, the dignity, the livelihood, the economic yada yada, the money gets reinvested in the community. There's nothing bad. There's nothing bad about worker cooperatives, worker ownership and cooperatives generally. And yet the Small Business Administration, which is a federal agency, all of their programs, especially their loan programs, emergency loans, the 7A uh, loans to small businesses, they penalize. You're not really eligible for them if you're a cooperative, a consumer co-op or a worker co-op. There's a whole personal guarantee issue. Um, if you try to get a loan from a bank, 
there's no law saying that Wells Fargo can't finance your purchase of an existing business to make it become worker owned or to launch a business or even a franchise and expand. But find me an underwriter, just pick one out of any major bank in the US and try to sell them on this idea that like, well, we're going to pool this risk among, you know, 35 co-owners of this hardware store. They're like, what the hell are you talking about? I need one person to sign on the dotted line. Whose assets am I going to pursue? The pandemic has shaken up the world of work. And now there is an increasing number of people wondering what's next. For many, 2020 and 2021 have been a time for reflection, for pressing reset, and figuring out what they really want from work and life. And for some, that means starting a business, and maybe even experimenting with co-op ownership. People are re-evaluating their work and careers and thinking about ways to start their own business. So who knows what will come of that and how many co-ops we'll see emerge from more of a startup entrepreneurial form or people just turning their side hustle that they do with, you know, five friends who clean homes or who paint houses or who do catering or language interpretation um, and, and forming that into a business. But it isn't just people looking to start a new venture who can benefit from these models. There is an increasing number of established business owners who are looking for a way to perhaps share the workload, begin to retire, or ensure the future of their business. Conversions are increasing, and often people arrive at it not because they're like, I, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had this vision that really I should just sell my business to my employees. No, it was the, they already looked at the other options that they're familiar with and aware of, which is, does somebody, one of my competitors want to buy my business? The answer was no. Your business is too small. We're, we're talking about micro businesses mostly that are, that are converting to employee ownership. CVS doesn't want to buy your tiny pharmacy that has, you know, 12 people working there. So that option's ruled out. The family businesses, the kids don't want it. They went off to college or they moved to another uh, part of, of the country or another part of the world and they have their own passions and dreams. They're not like trying to do the thing that mom and dad were doing. And finally, in a lot of places, rural communities are either depopulating or facing other kinds of economic problems. And so there isn't really a market for selling that business. And in a lot of urban communities, especially ones that are gentrifying, there's a lot of displacement happening. The risks of, you know, who wants to buy that business that's already threatened by gentrification. So it ends up being, th those end up being the main entry points for them to either find us or for us to find them. Some of the owners actually stick around in the company and they become co-owners along with the other workers there. I think especially when the owners are younger uh, founders and, uh, and maybe they decide to sell the business to their co-workers when they're in their 30s, 40s, or 50s and they continue to do that even if they're not imminently retiring. Models that empower workers with ownership and control can provide a way forward for individuals who previously might have struggled to find a way into business. And models that encourage rewarding experiences, learning and leadership at every level are also great for business. As we explored in the Zingerman's episode, when you empower employees with knowledge and responsibility, they not only feel better in themselves, but also become better at understanding how they can make a positive impact. I think that we're excited for what the future holds and excited to bring in even more employee owners we already have 13 owners, but even more bigger community where everyone feels like they have a say because that's what we're really all about. We're all about community and we're really excited to keep it going. Trident's firing on all cylinders right now. It's it's really beautiful to watch. Everyone is like 100% on their projects. Everyone is like just there, there, there. It's all coming together like very beautifully. I mean, on top of all the financials and the back end of things, I've learned that running a business is not about an individual it's about a community and being able to work with your co-workers and your co-owners is one of the most like, rewarding things to be able to come to a consensus and to respect everyone's opinions and value everyone's thoughts i love it so much it's so rewarding to be able to work with people that care about a community just as much as you do i would love to start my own small business someday I don't know what it'll be, maybe a bookstore, maybe a Trident somewhere else. <laughs> it's clear to see that there's a deep level of pride that comes with business ownership, especially for the employees who own a part of the businesses they devote their time to. They commit to building it for the long term. 
They care about the day-to-day -day customer experiences and they consider the greater community in every decision they make. Ownership also helps people in ways that salaries can't. It gives you something to leverage, something to set you up for a more solid financial future and something you can call your own. As we see more and more people interested in business ownership and the chance to follow their own path, we can see the employee ownership model becoming more and more appealing. While many businesses, especially those with minimum wage jobs, are struggling to find workers to fill their vacancies, worker cooperatives and employee-owned businesses are on the rise and in many cases, thriving. People are looking for a different kind of work, something that rewards them with more than just salaries. And a new wave of employee-owned businesses and co-ops are rising to the occasion and offering more workers the chance to take ownership and build a better future for themselves. This episode of Small Business Big Lessons was written by me, Ash Reed. Script edited by my teammate, Ariel Tannenbaum, and produced by Rowan Bishop at Message Heard. We're making this podcast because we believe in a different way to do work. And we want to share the stories of the businesses inspiring us. We also share our own story transparently over at buffer.com forward slash open. If this episode has inspired you or is helping you think about building your business in new ways, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet us at Buffer, head to Apple Podcasts to leave us a review and be sure to subscribe.